This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Alias to another episode of The Banyan, and take it away. Mm-hmm. Let me start by saying this man, Samir Bayham, deserves a round of applause. He's the audio expert. He makes all of this possible. Mm-hmm. Tonight's a special night for a few reasons. The first that we have paintings on display. It's the first time I've had the background change fundamentally. For good reason, we're joined by a very good friend, a talented painter, one of Lebanon's best, Tom Young. Round of applause for Tom Young. Thank you. Tom was a recent guest of mine on MTV Podcast, and we talked about his two most recent exhibitions, but I think this, this exchange will be a little loose. We'll talk more about our shared love for Beirut. I will honor earlier exhibitions as well. I've brought the accompanying pamphlets, so I'll share these in the audience. But I'd like everyone, while we're talking, to appreciate Tom's work. I think there's five paintings on display, if I'm not mistaken. Uh Is that right? Yes. Great. There is. And perhaps we can bring these paintings to life as well, as we speak. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, happy birthday to you. (laughs) <laughs> for turning 50 last week. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. You look yeah. good for 50. Eh, well, you know, painting uh, helps. Painting helps? Doing what you love. Maybe following that, your heart. Maybe yeah. that's why I look so bad at 42. Uh. <laughs> I turned 42 yesterday. <laughs> a fellow Gemini. Yeah. Let's begin Double. with, in a way, you've, you've managed to survive the worst crisis of modern Lebanese history. You have a studio that just opened up the street here. Mm-hmm. And when we're done, for anyone that wants to see the studio, we can join Tom after we're done recording. It's literally mm-hmm. just up the street. But I get the feeling from you in different ways that this relationship to Lebanon is non-negotiable. In other words, things can get worse mm-hmm. and you're still going to be here. Yep. Things can get much worse, and you'll be painting this country yes, in its beauty and its tragedy. Is yeah. that a fair assessment that there's no leaving Lebanon? Certainly, certainly at the moment. And of course, that's, that's all we know is, is the present moment. But for sure, I mean, as a, as a painter, I guess I have a different set of sort of priorities. Um, and for me, inspiration is everywhere. Uh, and it's not just about the joy and the beauty of Lebanon, of which, you know, there's so much. But yeah, it is very much about emotion. And emotion comes in all forms, you know, yeah, joy, happiness, but pain and, and trauma too. So yeah, I, I just find it an incredibly rich and inspiring place to be um, in all of its joy and pain. And I know that's, it's become a bit of a cliche that, that yeah, these, these extremes, heaven and hell, but, but it's, you know, there's something p- elemental and something incredibly true about Lebanon, I, I feel. Um, and as a painter, it's incredible. I mean, I can't believe that there aren't more artists here from, from, from other countries. It's the most amazing place um, to, to observe, you know, as a painter, to some extent from a distance you know, be the witness, be, be the ob- observer. Um, but at the same time, be absolutely involved and a part of it um, so that there isn't a separation. There's a, there's a sense in which this place for me is almost a projection or reflection of 
perhaps myself and the life that I've lived and some of my experiences. So uh, that's, that's really very uh, precious to have found such a place. I mean, I mean a lot of people never do. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't want to leave. And, I, and you know, as well, because I care so much about it, I want to contribute something. Be, be, be a part of, you know, the recovery uh, and be a part of, the, of, of striving for justice and fairness um, as well through, through my arts. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to repeat things we've discussed before. If you want to better know Tom's personal reasons for being here, check out our recent discussion on MTV because we dedicated over an hour, really, to opening personal wounds. Yeah. So I won't do that again tonight, but I'll try to reflect on something right. you just said, which mm -hmm. I think is the first time I've heard you say it this way, that you're surprised other international artists don't do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. It's not a common trait for painters globally to find yeah. themselves in Lebanon. So this is a two-sided question. The first is, do you know, do you have an answer for that? Could it be simply that it's your personal relationship that mm. makes you drawn to this country, unlike other painters. And on the other side of that question, the second one, could you find truth in what you're doing here in other countries? Or is it really tied to this place? That's, yeah, good, good questions. Um, I came I, prepared. I, I, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, well, I think that... that uh, Yes, perhaps because Lebanon has such a bad name in the media, obviously, mm. that puts people off. Um, uh, of course, the media always focuses on the bad side and fear and the most extreme disasters and crises in Lebanon. So the people around the world, including artists, have a completely, um, I'd say, uh, misguided um, mm. stereotype of what Lebanon is. Um, so, so that's a part of it. And, and probably uh, people, artists around the world are, are, are afraid as well. Um, and I think that probably the economic crisis now doesn't help because mm. people are afraid that they won't sell their work. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to, to survive as an artist anywhere. Oh, so it could simply be a business reason too, or a ec personal economic reason. For, being, for me being here. Uh, no, for well, others that are not doing that similar journey, that they couldn't yeah. maybe market yeah. themselves because of that. Poss possibly, yeah. And the, the associations of being in Lebanon, mm. um, what that would mean for their image. or um, I, I, really, I really don't know. But, mm. but it, yeah, it's probably because, yeah, Lebanon's got such a bad name. Yeah. Um, and people don't see, you know, the magic that exists here, the... the, the um, the beauty, the, the sort of the sense of the spirits, the kind of something numinous, kind of glowing mm. from from this place. That that even you know, you know, a forest of ugly concrete tower blocks for me can look beautiful in the evening sun. It's something. It's something else. It's something beyond the image. It's it's something I I personally feel almost a sort of spiritual sense here. Mm. Mm. Um, that emanates from the place and the people for me are, are generally you know incredibly kind and and, and welcoming uh, and that's lovely as a painter because I, I work alone um i am in to some extent a foreign land so so it, it's lovely to have that sense of of, mm. of of warmth um from the place and the people um and but you you mentioned there the economic aspects because for me actually i was struggling in london i, I lived in london for 12 years mm. originally from from england and i yeah i i honestly i was i was selling enough to scrape by but i was often in debt yeah and actually by coming to lebanon i found the key not just to my artistic and emotional door but actually the paintings i made here actually were selling um, right. as well in Lebanon. So but this was back in 2006, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. um, and 
gallery, a, a gallery Ida Chefan, I will always be indebted to her, you know, picked me up and, and bought a lot of my work in cash. Said, Tom, this is great. No one is doing this in Lebanon, you know. You have to come here and live, you know, t- at least for six months to do an exhibition. Um, and, and so this is really why or how I first uh, came to live here. And, and so to some extent, I, I was an economic migrant, but going the <laughs> other way. Yeah. Um, and I know how privileged that is. Um, and I know, you know, that it's thousands, millions of people do not have that choice. And, and I know, I, of course, I have a British passport. I can get out. I have a, a plan B and I, I'm aware of that privilege. But I also am aware of how precious it is to find a place where your art, where one's art actually really works. So let me push um, a little bit on the slightly uncomfortable terrain and then we can go back in time. Yeah. It's the second part of that question, which is many places have conflict. Mm. Many countries have beautiful landscape. There are many cities that are war um, cities like it could be in Ukraine today. Uh, You could go back to to Europe and find cities that are, in a way, there's a similar pain expressed. I remember going to Sarajevo not long after that war ended, going to Kosovo as well, and Mm -hmm. feeling something there that feels familiar to me coming from here. You can always find a conflict and you can always find a place to paint. Is it, is it fair to suggest that in your case, it's not about that, it's closer to this country and whatever that country means to you, rather yeah. than finding yourself in Georgia? Yeah, well, and, and I have painted in Sarajevo as well, and I, I was in Sarajevo before the war in 91, oh. and more recently uh, painting there. Um, and sure, you know, the Balkans has a similar, almost sectarian yeah. uh, structural. Um, Even sometimes conflict. the architecture can really feel familiar. Yeah. This Ottoman way yeah. of urban planning. Yeah. It resonates. And, and, and even, you know, the, and in Berlin, I, was, I, I, I went to Berlin and I've been to other, yeah, other places where, you know, the old Iron Curtain, Eastern Europe. Um, uh, other places in the world, India, South Africa, you know, the border between India and Pakistan, I've, I painted there. Um, and I have experienced some of these other parts of the world. So there are, there are definitely these places that I've been to that resonates because of that conflict, because of that trauma that, uh, yes, that I experienced, let's say, in my own personal family life, mm. uh, that I see projected in national situations, should we mm-hmm. say. But yeah, Lebanon had a, has a particular combination of these factors that come together um, in a way that I've never experienced anywhere else. It's as if there's a, there's a, there's a I, I find a faith here. I find uh, a connection. And what is art and life really all about? It's, well, connection. This is what we all are desperate to find. Uh, and yet we are all alone in, in, in many respects. Um, we're all well, alone together. <laughs> yes. Um, but um, the reason yeah. I go down this road and the reason I feel lucky in asking you these personal questions really is that you are a unique character and modern Beirut history, you Mm. do stand out in what you do for its quality, but also for your decision to survive severe economic crisis that I'm sure has impacted you as well. Yeah. And the Port Blast. And we both live in this neighborhood. We're both lucky to be here. Absolutely. And for you, and you mentioned it earlier, yeah, it's an issue of just going to the airport and leaving. Yet you're still here. That, to Mm. me, reminds me of someone we've talked about off mic. You're not the same person, obviously. I think you're healthier, you're brighter in general. I think you shine more. It's Robert Fisk. Ah. 
And I know bless him. his Rest career is not in art, but no. in a way it was in storytelling on his terms. You're a storyteller too. Um, yeah. Some people admire your work. Some are harsh critics. I think the same went for Robert Fisk. He yeah. had a school. He had a, a class of journalists that worshipped him. He had others that despised him, but it didn't matter. He loved Beirut and he mm. stayed here. Yeah. Well into his later years. Mm. I think you have that kind of story in you. And I never got the chance to ask him. He was supposed to be on the podcast before uh -huh. he passed. Uh, I never got the chance to ask him why he decided to never leave permanently. Mm. Now I get to ask you. And I think mm. it's something there. Mm. There is a something very deep, very personal that yeah. can keep someone here. Yeah. When they don't it's, need to be here. It's a, a sense of love. Which, which, you know, I guess the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing, as, as you know, Pascal once said. Um, and there's something that is beyond, you know, rational explanation. It's just, it's, it's about a feeling. Uh, and ultimately, that's it. And I, and I paint that feeling, yeah. hopefully, you know, with, with, with a sense of light. And I think, of course, you know, the gorgeous Mediterranean light and the climate here is fantastic for an artist. The, the, the multi-layered history, the, the incredible sort of palimpsest of different cultures mm. that have left their trace, traces here. The, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, the culture, the wine, the passes, the mountains, the beautiful landscapes and valleys. And, and the, but yeah, I don't see, think that's it's, the it's, reason you're here, Tom. You can find yeah. that in Belgrade. You can find that even probably in Odessa right now right. in the Ukraine. You, you, Andalusia, you can, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I can, I'm thinking more, more unstable environments that produce great art. Mm. I, think, I think you can find that many parts of the world. Yeah. I don't think you're here because the wine tastes good. Well, that's that's some of it. As, some of it, as okay. our friend Michael. <laughs> then you Karen are like you are like Robert Fisk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but no, it is it is that connection to to the essence of life mm. and death. You yeah, know, the, the the sense of those both both two elements are always in play here. Mm -hmm. And I think also it, most great works of art and literature and music have that sense of life and death in them. They're, they're, if you strip them down to their essence, they are about that. Um, that transition or tension, a journey perhaps, you know, um, from life to death, death to life. Um, I mean, well, one of them is right here. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. But, uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna dedicate a lot of time to this baby and that one too. They're the same structure. They're yeah. maybe telling slightly different stories. Yeah. I yeah. just want to share this with the audience. The best articles I've read about you were from Robert Fisk himself. Mm. They were yeah. in The Independent. Mm. Um, I recommend anyone to check those out. And they're a bit dated now. It's some five, six years ago, maybe. Mm. Yeah, the last one was during COVID. Actually. Right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, two, three years ago. Regardless of other opinions he may have shared in his writing, the man could write. And I think his better articles were about subjects like your work in his later years. I highly recommend to check them out. Um, we're going to get into the Holiday Inn. But before mm -hmm. that, Tom, you gave me permission to touch on touchy subjects tonight. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. And one is something I, I know. I don't know if you knew that I knew this before. Uh, it's not that you just... I mean, you've been, you've been detained. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> right, I've I've, uh, I've 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 explored various penitentiaries, uh, <laughs> and you, well, you, 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 I've um, I've never heard anyone give a more diplomatic answer. What yeah, was it? Yeah. I've explored various penitentiaries. I, yeah, I've been on a sort of research mission uh, mission to to uh, <laughs> to uncover the meaning of freedom by losing it. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Remind me though, you weren't you weren't looking to get in jail. It, it's not that you were knocking on Rumi's door. Okay, come on, let me in. <laughs> let me in. I'm sick of being trapped in this world. I want to. I, yeah. Um, so t well, tell us what you can about those 
moments that you experienced earlier, really at the start of your career here? Yeah. Ah, yes, the one that included, yes. 2006, if I'm not mistaken? Two, well, 2006, yeah, was my first trip here before the, the war in, in right. the summer. Yeah. I l fell in love with Lebanon immediately and decided to come back um, in the summer. The day that I had my flight booked was the day the Israelis started bombing Beirut oh. uh, airports. Wow. So it was, you know, I couldn't come. And, but I had lots of new friends here. Mm. And, of course, I was incredibly moved and, and well, angry and, and upset by what happened. So I decided to come back immediately after the, the conflict and do workshops in, in Dahir with children who, who'd, been, who'd suffered terribly in, in the conflict. This is just and months after the July War. Yeah. So just, the end of 2006. Yeah. It, it was in the autumn of 2006. Okay. So I, I came back and I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, I was used to painting the River Thames and, you know, sort of London streets and in the south of France and vineyards and Italy and, you know, um, and, you know, to paint such scenes of devastation was, was truly moving. And also to work with the children and to bring their stories and their drawings back to London to mm. show people in London, look, what's going on here you know what's who uh, so I suppose to try to give the children a voice because mm. they're so we don't often hear that you know we just hear politicians talking about geopolitics you know how about the individuals on the ground and so I, I was moved to use my art in a way that I'd never used it before um, could you, could you then, walk me through that did you simply invite yourself into Dahir with your paintbrush and your what, what uh, is it structured or is it just you alone base yeah it was something i i i decided to do and then i found a way of of doing it mm. so through a lebanese friends in london and i got to know some ngos here in beirut who were working on the ground setting up workshops in dahi mm. in in the west hit areas and i wanted to use my art to kind of transgress those boundaries those sectarian boundaries which is something i i try to do quite a lot um and yeah so i i i did that and i worked there and and then eventually i came back to lebanon um actually via india which is a bizarre story i hmm. i'd um i'd actually got a bit afraid that i was getting too enmeshed in this place lebanon which hmm. i felt was identifying with the trauma too much and this is not going to be good for me so mm. i have to find a way and then i got some commissions in india and i thought wow go to india i'm going to forget all about lebanon because uh, india is such a mind-blowing sort of universe in its own right and it, it, that's true it is and but I, I i went there and came back to london with my indian paintings and an indian art dealer found out about me, came round to my studio in Chelsea at the time in London, and he, he said, Tom, you know, I love your work. Uh, I'd love to give you a show. Um, he's a very eminent Indian art dealer, only does exhibitions about India, nothing else. And he saw my work and he said, look, I, I like your Indian paintings, but what, is, what are these? Mm. And he saw my paintings of bombed out Beirut and the children's drawings that I'd done, collective yeah. drawings that I'd done with them. And he said, you know, Tom, I'm going to give you a show, but for the first time in my 40, 50 year career, I, I don't want an exhibition about, Lebanon, uh, about India. I want you to go back to Lebanon. Wow. So I thought, well, I think something something is i'm being told something here there's some sort of guidance maybe going so all on all of this is his fault <laughs> well to some extent that's yes. that's part of the journey <laughs> and maybe you know i felt okay stop resisting it basically mm. stop stop because this is clearly something that i'm supposed to be doing yeah um but i came back and i thought i'd go back to dahir to 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 paint the reconstruction that was going on right. all of those you know bomb craters and sort of devastated concrete blocks were coming rising up again yeah 
went back there uh, with actually Sue, fr a friend from Baalbek, who's a Shia Lebanese. I thought I was safe, and, and a, actually a friend from, from England who's a journalist. Sketching in Dahir, observing the reconstruction. Bad idea. <laughs> because so you're just sitting in a bombed out part of Dahir with yeah. your. Just, just painting. Yeah, well, I'm, tr a, I'm trying to really in, imagine what happened yeah. in a in a cafe, but but basically drawing, um, you know, from the cafe what was going on I and see. making detailed architectural s sketches, basically. Right. Yeah. But what I didn't do is get permission from the local security force, as we know, Hezbollah, and they you know, perhaps quite quite understandably, here's a Westerner. We've just been bombed. This guy is making detailed sketches of our buildings. Who is he? Um, so they came, well, they came in and arrested me at, at, with guns, basically. I mean, it was, it was suddenly got quite frightening. And yeah, and, and, they, and they took me, and it, it was like a movie, you know, blindfold, um, shoved in the back of a jeep blacked out windows you know it was uh you know we weren't we weren't you know telling jokes you know they, this was uh, this was uh, uh can you get me out of here please i think i've i think i've taken a wrong turn i, just, I felt um yeah uh but you know perhaps something in me perhaps wants to push the boundaries and to go to those areas to, and maybe even do something a bit stupid to, to almost provoke some sort of event or happening. And so this is why I say Robert Fisk is because this is the kind of career I think he didn't expect to have when he arrived, but then suddenly he's drawn as a reporter, as a journalist, he's drawn to watching a city trying to navigate itself through conflict. In your case, it's post-July war. That's why I find that a familiar trait in that you're drawing suffering of a place. And despite that detainment, you're still painting this country. And you, uh, yeah. how long was that moment where you're blindfolded and taken? Well, I was, I was detained for about six hours. Six hours. Which was a very long you know, time when mm. you're in that situation. Yeah, and interrogated through a, a one-way mirror in a little cell. Oh. Um, and during that time, I, I found a bit of shawarma wrapper on the, paper, on the floor from a previous prisoner, and I had a pen in my pocket. And I thought, this is an ideal opportunity to do a self-portrait. In, in, because, I mean, <laughs> well, I've come here to paint. Why should I let these people stop me, you know? How interesting, you know. I think this you, is when they let you go, right? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> there you go. Maybe even who does he them. work for? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, okay. maybe you know, use that as well to prove that I was an artist. Yeah. Um, but also, really interesting <laughs> moment to, because I was so scared and I really, I really was afraid, obviously. Um, and I, all I could see was myself in the mirror. Um, and so I thought, I'm afraid, why not draw that fear? And this is, a, this is almost it's a sort of classic meditation technique to, mm -hmm. to sort of embrace whatever the present moment brings. So, you know, if you are afraid, then don't resist that, don't push that away. Actually channel it into an artwork. It, it was a moment when I, that I'll never forget. It was, it was a, like something connected. Uh, and, and I, I really got into the self-portraits. And by drawing my fear, the fear went away. Um, so, yeah, it was an amazing experience. And I even sort of kind of forgot what, he, what the uh, interrogator was saying. He, you know, excuse me, can you ask that again? I'm trying to get my nose right. You know, I'm sort of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was sort of, there was an absurdity as well to the situation do, do you have that sketch with you i do i you? don't have it with me no, no, now, not but here I, but, you, but i do have it you yeah have it. yeah i i do still have that it's it's a biro on shawarma wrapper perhaps 
wow. one of the most um, precious drawings I've got. And, uh, and actually, we even kind of sort of made friends with the voice on the other side of mm. the mirror because he said, you know, um, what do you think of us? Yeah, Hezbollah. And I, I just said, what, what, what can I say in this moment which is true? Um, and I said, look, I love Lebanon. I love Lebanon. And I love anyone who, de who, who, who defends Lebanon. Now, um, I didn't qualify that in any way. And there are very good reasons for you know, believing different um, angles to that. But um, I tried to be diplomatic. And I, and I realized that I had to, 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 to be very careful. You know, I had to get out of here. Um, and, and then he said, well, do you have any enemies? Um, and I said, uh, no, but maybe myself sometimes. You really said this when yeah. you were being into Really? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and he said, oh, don't, don't, you know, don't worry. You know, don't worry. You know, we can see that you're a good person. You're, you're going to be all right. So the voice said, almost, you're going to be all right in this life. There was something sort of almost, <laughs> it, was, it was an extraordinary experience. And, and then wow. he said, you know, what are your best qualities and what are your worst qualities? And yeah, it was like, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a real sort of psychological uh, investigation, uh, which was very interesting. It was a bit like being on the therapist couch. I was going to uh, say, uh, you but, found a therapist in Dahi. I think you sh I kind yeah. of want his number now. Yeah, right. He's very good. He seems to be all right. Yeah. Um, it's certainly uh, an interesting, challenging experience. And then, and then he said, um, uh, yeah, yeah. He, 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 he said, you know, I think you're going to be okay. Um, and I was thinking... I, you know, I don't want a job with you guys. You know, what, what, is there some sort of, you know, exactly job, job assessment? Um, but um, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to think that my art can, though, appeal to people of, of, of all kinds, whether I agree with them or not. That's actually well said. And I'm going to emphasize the other episode we did on MTV. There's uh, a, roughly maybe 30 minutes or so, 20 or 30 minutes, dedicated to an exhibition in Saida. It's called Revival. I'm going to share this with the audience. Maybe just pass it around. That's okay. And that the reason I'm mentioning this up front is a recent exhibition where that essence you're just describing here, mm. trying to reach out to everyone in this country, Yeah, I think... Revival is that. It's an exhibition in the, in the new Hamam in Saida, in the souks. It's one of the most breathtaking exhibitions I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's your work on display in the background. Uh, there was a pianist performing as well when I went. Mm -hmm. But it's the best way to explore your work. And it's in Saida. It's not Jamezi. No. It's yeah. Saida. And you, yeah. in a way, pushing people that you know are not always eager to go to Saida to go. Right. And I went right. for that reason. So back in 2006, in a way you're capturing a very delicate moment, a violent moment, mm -hmm. and you're being diplomatic with Hezbollah while they've arrested you. Yeah. Six hours later, are you on a flight out of the country? Well... No, actually, I got a taxi back into Beirut, went to the Prague bar in Hamra, <laughs> yeah. and then a friend walked by and said, hey, Tom, you know, we're having a house party tonight. Do you want to come? So the next, my, literally an hour later, I was at this house party in a beautiful old house with, you know, people dancing and food and wine and all the rest of it. Wow. Um, and, and they played Lou Reed's Such a Perfect Day on the sound system. <laughs> And I thought, what is going on? Where am I? Wow. And yeah, that's, 
Yeah, that was quite a, a, a uh, let's say, a turnaround, uh, quite an extreme day. Let me jump from that extreme day that you, you're, you're a very gifted storyteller, by the way. That's a, it's, that's a great story. I, ho- I hope you find, I mean, if you haven't already, I hope you write that down because there's yeah. a lot going on there. That, and that's just the beginning of it. That's just the beginning. That's literally yeah. the intro. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. Uh, with your permission, we can remove this if you're not comfortable. It's mm. not the only time you've been in jail. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that wasn't really in jail. That's Hezbollah. That was a day. That's, That's interrogation by Hezbollah. Yeah, yeah that was a uh, a day trip. That was a day trip, and you're partying at night after the Prague. So you found a way to calibrate that. Uh, but the second round, as much as you can share, uh, yeah, that was that was that 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 did go a bit deeper. I remember well, the day that it happened. A mutual friend of ours were trying to find a lawyer to get you out. Ah, I, yes, yes. Within God. an hour or so, Tom Young's in jail. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 a strange thing. It's I might as well say that in fact, my dad, my my father in England is a judge, and it's it's quite a well known thing that judges' sons have to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so some people say. <laughs> but um uh yeah i think i i mean i was particularly careless that day um yeah we can probably should we remove this one we yeah. could but i'm gonna say it anyway tonight so you know okay you, you yeah. decide after if it's in or out in the yeah. episode okay. yeah anyway i've got nothing to hide i'm 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 up for truth um and so i yeah i had some hash in my pocket i was gonna go back to england and see some friends and i thought why not take a bit of local produce you know uh back to england just 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 a little bit just a little bit uh not a very wise idea (laughs) um and again maybe i was being careless because i was sort of pushing something almost Mm. possibly provoking some kind of events that Mm. was challenging and a bit traumatic it seems to be something that i do it, it's it's um you're or pushing it, to or the it, edge i mean yeah or perhaps and perhaps i got a bit disenchanted as well with the art scene and the music scene in, mm. in beirut at the time organizing parties and there was people were being a bit cliquey and backstabbing and and rich people were not paying on time for my paintings and it was all getting a bit unpleasant and i was losing 2010 or around then 11 11 yeah and i was sort of losing faith in what i was doing Mm. again and then basically got got course at the airport they thought what are you doing maybe they thought um i was smuggling this was some sort of i was taking back a sample to, Mm. to to set up a bigger operation or perhaps our you know our friends in hezbollah also who were in control of the airport security as we know um uh, that's the guy <laughs> it's him again <laughs> it's him right let's get him <laughs> um this time we'll really we'll know, really yeah. we'll rub it in um we'll make him pay and so yeah they they um they did uh it, it just escalated. I thought, oh, I'm going to miss my flights. Oh, I might have to pay a fine. Oh, I might, I might have to fly tomorrow. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And, and in the end, I spent, well, two weeks in, in, in cells with you know, 13 other prisoners with barely enough space to lie down and on a concrete floor. And, you know, that scene at the end of... Um, um, Kapanau, Kapanau, yeah. I'm the, yeah. the one of uh, under Adli. Yes. When they right. go into the prison and that. When well, he's, he's trying to call or. The, yeah. the last scene the of last the movie. Scene. Yes. Well, well, I was in that prison. There's more to it than that. But, so but those two weeks you're in Adli. Well, uh, the first, first week, Habesh in Hamra, oh. which is really tough. Yeah. And then in uh, Baabda, and, which is, they're also underground prisons right. up, up there. Uh, and yeah, as the only obviously white, very white guy, um, and it, quite potentially quite scary. Yeah. Um, 
But luckily, I made friends with some good guys in, the, in my cell. You know, I, I'd been to boarding school in England, so I knew how to sort of negotiate the dormitory situation. <laughs> I mean, it was sort of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they say, you know, it's training for the outside world. Well, in that case, it sort of, it sort of was. Um, and, and so they, um, yeah, so I, I was there. And again, I realized this was a great opportunity to, to, do, to, to draw some portraits um, as a way to connect to my fellow prisoners and a way to sort of harmonize, you know, the atmosphere there. And, and so I, a friendly prison guard um, smuggled in some paper and some uh, and a pen, and then actually my my girlfriend at the time, our friends and all, um, uh, smuggled in a sketchbook and pastels, so really good good quality. I, so, rem- I remember her telling me that's what she was doing. Mm. I didn't believe her. I mean, there's no way Tom is doing this while he's in jail. Yeah, and wow. then I found out it was true. Yeah. And it still it. surprises me. It shocks me that you can meditate to a point where you're with a dozen or so prisoners and you can check out of that and go into what you do. That's an incredible detachment, I think. Well, both detachment and completely at, and, a, and, a, and a sort of, let's say, integration of what's happening yeah. into what, I'm right. doing. And so maybe this ties back to the point at the beginning about mm. why do I stay when there's so much suffering? Yes. Because if maybe by embracing the suffering and not pushing it away, mm. but by, by harnessing it and transforming it, channeling, channeling it into creative action, then it's not let so bad anymore. Right. Um, and, and in fact, it was in those two weeks, in, in those cramped cells, that I really fell in love with art again. I mean, I really could see yeah. the value of what I was doing because, because my fellow prisoners were, you know, loved engaging with me and posing for the portraits and telling me their stories. And then I, I gave the original drawings to them. And then there's a way of putting a bit of paper over a drawing and rubbing through. Mm, mm. And it makes a print of, of, of the original drawing. And then I used that, so I kept the prints. And the guys in my cell had, uh, had their kind of jobs of, of rubbing through. So we kind of set up a kind of, <laughs> a kind of art school, sort of art <laughs> factory. <laughs> in Teaching how to paint in... In, in, the cell. in the cell, yeah. And we kind of had an exhibition. Um, it, 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 was, it was during um, it was it was during Ramadan, I think, at the time. And there, and and there was some call to do some sort of caritas or something. Yeah, these NGOs actually visited the prison and said, "Oh, you you should be doing some art therapy, or you should be doing." I said, "What do you think I'm doing?" <laughs> You know, and, and also there was this sort of weird sense of being visited by yeah. sort of white saviour, do-gooding, let's go and try and fix the world sort of people. And I'm, and I'm the one on the other side <laughs> in jail with, you know, with the people that the NGOs are trying to help. It's, it's that, 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 that was a strange shift as well, yeah. which is pr- probably quite good because it gave me a perspective on on this elements of, of you do gooding so you know, connect, being the white guy connecting with their story you rediscovered your own passion for art in lebanon yeah and and really what it means for people mm. regardless of selling out yeah. out of the gallery world out of yeah just relating human being to human being mm. particularly when we were all suffering together We'd all lost our freedom. Right. And that really, that experience stays with me. And it, and it means, it almost means that really anything on the outside world that happens, to some extent, I can see it in some perspective. And 
there is an element at which you, you know you truly appreciate your freedom perhaps only when you know what it's like to lose it uh are you in touch with any of these prisoners are they out do you, do you see them well sadly i i um I took their numbers actually and, and, and said we would stay in touch. And I, and I wrote their numbers down in the back of a book that I was reading at the time and put it in my bag. When I was deported back to London, uh, I went back to England for a year. Um, and sadly, my car was broken into as soon as I got back to London and that bag was stolen with the numbers in. So, but if we're supposed to meet again, then we will. And uh, I think, uh, in a way, we'll always know each other. And, and they will always have those drawings. Yeah. We'll, uh, it'll, it'll stay with us. Perhaps we don't, we don't have to connect directly. So, yeah. we'll fast forward that year that you're away. Uh, just before then... This is the pamphlet from Tom's recent exhibition in Beit Beirut called Motherland, which is really, I think, if I may say, it's the most personal journey into your own story. Mm. And Motherland, I think, is appropriately titled. It's Lebanon, it's nature, it's wonder, it's beauty, and it's your own mom and the loss of your mom. Uh, I'll share this with the audience. Again, this is on MTV Podcast was another, I think, 30 minutes dedicated to that. Let's now jump yep. into mm -hmm. the subject that I think brings us together. Mm -hmm. It's a strange sight. Uh, you have your relationship to it. I have my relationship as well. Uh, you're 50, I'm 42, which means we've never seen it function, mm. whether on no. television or in person. No. But we're both drawn to this monster, this beast, yeah. which right. is behind us. And well, it was it was built the same year that I was born. Well, there which you go. Which is interesting. But so yes, nineteen seventy-three. Three. Yeah, I can do math. <laughs> Look at that. Hey. Nice, nice. Did well. The Holiday Inn. Yeah. Now, this portrait, which is outstanding, and that is the. Remind pinnacle? Le, le, yes, le pinnacle. Le pinnacle. Something That's like that. the rotating bar at the top of the Holiday Inn. The structure is there. I mean, there's no, there's nothing left of it, but that's really what it looks like when you walk in. Yeah. And I think those are the two for the Holiday Inn. I can't see further back, but that's... Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the one year anniversary after the explosion. Sorry, March, yes. Uh, that's here is amazing. That's amazing. So yeah. let's dive deep into the Holiday Inn. Okay, let's do it. I'll let you start and I will end it with my own reasons for loving this site. Um, there's many buildings in Beirut that survived the Civil War. There's yeah. other hotels in the hotel district that yeah. look a lot like the Holiday Inn from the yeah. outside and inside. Uh, soldiers shot at each other. Militiamen battled across the Green Line. The Holiday Inn is impressive in its size. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a franchise hotel mm -hmm. that's been shut down for yeah. a very long time. Yeah. 50 years. Yes, indeed. It operated for 18 months or 20 yeah. months or so. Mm -hmm. And then it's been in a state of war ever since. Yeah. Why are you drawn to the Holiday Inn? Well, I think it's because of, again, the emotion that it embodies in concrete. Um, and it's, it's, it's like a kind of architectural expression of, of this, this unhealed wound that Lebanon has. And to some extent, I identify with that. Um, I certainly haven't healed all my wounds yet, but I'm, I'm in the process of that. It's a journey. Um, so when I see the Holiday Inn, I, do, I don't just see a building. I see, I see the emotion that's embedded in, the, in its walls um, and what it, what it means. What it, and also the resonance 
that the structure has. It's, it's, you know, it is like a giant tomb, um, you know, that stands in the center of the city like an unresolved wound. And it's a reminder to all of us uh, of what we want to avoid happening again. Um, but it has a grandeur, it has a majestic presence. And I think because of the dysfunction of the ownership situation, which is a, it's like a microcosm of the dysfunction of Lebanon altogether, you know, the fact that it, nothing can be done with it because the majority shareholders, the Kuwaiti al-Sabah family, I gather, want to pull it down and build something new. Um, and the minority shareholder, uh, Roland Abdini, who's the son of the developer, he loves the structure and he, he thinks it's very important for Lebanon's history. And it reminds him, of course, of his father and he wants to keep it. Um, sure, renovate it, but, but it, it, it's, 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 it, it's a building of tremendous architectural merit as well. You know, because it was, well, it was designed by uh, the great uh, modernist architect, Le Corbusier's chief architect, André Vajensky, with the, um, with the help of, of Lebanese um, architects. Da, 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 da. It's, his name has disappeared from my mind. The Lebanese the architect, I don't know. I know that there's a Russian architect that was involved. André Vajensky. Oh, he's the Russian. Okay, yes. Yeah, who... Okay. who yeah. It, yeah. And it has many of the, the kind of noticeable features of Le Corbusier's mm. um, designs. Uh, the windows have the, are based on the golden section and there's the, there's the distinctive red tiled um, stairwell um, yeah. structures. There's, you know, it's, it's quite a, a stunning building um, in many, many respects. And You're it, talking about it though like it's a National Geographic essay. I want to know why you are drawn to this monster. The answers you're giving are, are correct for somebody that's researching the holiday. Yeah, this is, this is surface that's level surface. stuff. surface. Right, let's, let's dig deeper. Okay, enough, yeah. enough of the chit-chat. Right. No, let, I, let, I, I want to get as personal as I can about this structure. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, I think, I think because the Holiday Inn it is the iconic symbol of the Civil War, the beginning the Battle of the Hotels, um, when Lebanon obviously became divided along sectarian lines. Uh, it was occupied by Christian militias, then so-called Muslim, uh, Modabatun um, militias, and it was fought over. So it, was, it symbolizes to some extent the, the, the unresolved conflicts between human beings, between two sides that don't um, connect, two sides that uh, feel that the other is the enemy. It's, it's symbolic of something essentially human about the dysfunction of humanity, what we do to each other, the, the, the sense of the us and the them. Um, and I'm, I, 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 don't, I can't say that I've healed from this same syndrome myself. I have prejudices myself and fears about certain communities that I feel unsafe in. Um, and, I, and so I'm not, I'm not saying that I've, I'm coming from any high position here, but I, but I, I recognize something deeply human about it. Um, and something that, sure, we need to work on, we need to heal from. Um, and and I think as well, it symbolizes something to do with my own personal family experience. Um, the experience of trauma and tragic death. You know, my, well, my mother took her own life when I was 10. And the family uh, has become divided uh, ever since. And these traumas have sort of led to more traumas, um, more, you know, sadly, more tragic deaths. And, uh, more dysfunction in my own family background. And without going into details, the way I've experienced life, now this may be an illusion, I don't know, but it's, it's true for me that, um, that I've, I've been used to, say, being in the middle of, say, a battle 
or battles being fought through me between sides of my family that don't connect and, and don't show any signs of truly accepting the other. So when I'm painting the Holiday Inn, I'm not just painting Lebanon, this building, and the Battle of the Hotels. I'm, I'm painting, the, in some ways, a self-portrait as well. And self-portrait is exactly what I feel as well, although I'm not a painter. Mm. So I'm going to explain my take a little later on this hotel. What you're saying about seeing yourself in it, I feel the same way. But I want to get into the way you got into the Holiday Inn. What kind of access did you need? Was it through well, the Lebanese army that you had to be monitored while you're painting inside? Well, yeah. well, it took a whole year of negotiations to get in. I mean, I had to get, in fact, letters from the blessing of Roland Abdini, whose father was the developer for it. Oh, um, you needed permission from him. And, and then he spoke to the Kuwaiti team yeah. and the legal team. And then the British ambassador wrote to uh, the, the general, the commander of the Lebanese army at the time, General Kahraji, and a letter from the British Foreign Office to, to, the, to the general of the Lebanese army recommending me and my work. In fact, that I go in there and do an exhibition, which is something I'd love to do, or, or maybe an art installation, um, which would be an incredible thing to do. Um, still a dream. Um, and so it took a whole year of negotiations and I had to go and meet the, uh, anyway, the, the legal team, the financial officer, it was, it was a lot of patience. Um, and I even painted this picture partly to show the army about what I wanted to do. Yeah. So in a way I, I was then using art, um, to try to to show to, to, to people who don't know much about art, to soldiers and, and, a, and a legal team about the essence of bringing a sense of life and hope through art to a building that, that, that was the symbol of suffering and pain. And, and I thought, how can I do that? Yeah but also pay respect to the people who've died there. So I had this, you know, the idea of, of, of a garden of forgiveness, which is, which is an idea developed by a friend of mine, Alexandra Asseli. Oh, I thought you were going to say sorry there. There is a that, garden of forgiveness. Well, that, that's the idea. That's the one, yeah. Alexandra Asseli. Mm. You know, a place of, of reflection and compassion. And, and again, so I thought, look, if I can't do it, if I can't make it happen, I can at least paint it and then show people what it could be. How, so how much time a, did they give you to stay in the Holiday Inn? Um, they gave me, well, really only a day. And in fact, they said, in fact, they said you could come back here for the next few days, even the next, you know, few weeks. Hmm. But... And this is an, interest, an interesting physical effect. I spent the day there drawing and painting. And I think I gather one of possibly the only artist ever to do that. And, and I got to the top and I painted on many of the floors and the roof. And indeed, the, you made it all the way. The restaurant at the top. And I, and I was escorted by a Lebanese army soldier from Akkad. A uh, great guy uh, who, who, and we became friends by, by the time we got to the 24, 24th <laughs> floor. Um, and I had all my camera equipment taken away, but I had my phone. And by the top, by the, by the time we got to the top, he said, come on, Tom, just give me your phone. Um, and and uh, I'll take some photos and, and film you. And that was strictly forbidden. Yeah. Um, now that film, I, get, I think, is the only film that exists um, of anyone at, within the Holiday Inn. But I, I couldn't give it, I can't show it in public because I felt, well, it would get him in serious yeah. trouble. And it might threaten my dream of doing the exhibition there because, I, you know, I, 
the legal team said no photographs or film. I mean, they wouldn't even allow Al Jazeera inside to film right. in, in their recent film. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it was an incredible experience. And I felt, obviously, the sort of sense of say, horror and sadness that human beings can do this to each other. Um, I felt a sense of empathy because of my own experience of conflicts and death in my immediate family. Um, and I felt also a kind of excitement about how amazing this place would be to do a, an exhibition in, you know, and an and excitement as an artist and an architect, because I trained as an architect as well. So I'm, I was just, you know, I, there were so many emotions, but, and I, I think, and I did by drawing on the site, I was really processing it. I was taking it in. I was connecting to the place. Um, and that's the value of drawing and painting from life is that it's a way to connect, uh, to, um, to become one with where you are. You're the only person I know who has sketched in a Hezbollah prison cell in a jail in Adli under the bridge and inside the Holiday Inn. I think you are the only person, the only artist that has done this in the Holiday Inn. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to share my relationship to the building. There is a, mm. there is a parallel story. Uh, you said self-portrait. Yeah. So I'll end it with the self-portrait. The Holiday Inn is what I remember first from Beirut. My mm. family, during the Civil War, we wouldn't come to Beirut. We would mm. go to Tripoli through Syria. So this is a long taxi ride from Damascus, from the airport, up to Tripoli. Mm. And getting into Lebanon in itself was problematic. This would be hours and hours and hours and hours just to get to Tripoli. Mm. And I remember this. First, first, just after the Civil War ended, coming down on the highway into Beirut. This is the first image I see is this hotel. Mm. Now, in the early 1990s, the Holiday Inn fit the scenery. Mm. The entire city center looked just like the Holiday Inn. Yeah. We talk about downtown all the time today. It's empty, it's deserted, it's a ghost town. Downtown was hell in the early 1990s. Mm. Sewage, stray dogs, trash, squatters everywhere, Syrian checkpoints all over the place. I have footage of my father carrying a camcorder, getting stopped by a Syrian checkpoint, but the video is pointed right at the Holiday Inn. Mm. And that's my first encounter with that hotel, and I remember it until today. You could still see the sign at the top. It mm. said Holiday Inn. That yeah. sign survived the war. Yeah. And I think today, if you look very, very closely on its western wall, if you look very closely, you'll see a bit of the L from the hotel. It's mm. still there. It's green. Yeah. For some reason, it's still there. So I have, a, I have a memory locked in time of this monster overlooking hell. So yeah. I, and, it, and it was the only major tower. No. In, there, in, were, there, there was, was Burj al-Mur. There was, but... Burj al-Mur and the Hilton. Ah, but the Hilton was destroyed. Yeah. I think the Hilton was never actually opened. Mm. And for anyone that cares, the Hilton is where that unfinished Hilton is right now. It's, mm. If you know where Starbucks is in downtown, not the Souks, but next to the Four Seasons, mm. that's where the Corniche was. Mm. All that land reclamation was trash, the Normandy trash dump. And you had this massive hotel, the Hilton, never opened, the Holiday Inn. Going back to self-awareness, uh, self or let's say self-portrait, mm. I would hear stories about this hotel from relatives, actually from my mom who's sitting right there alone. Uh, a date that she was on in the St. Charles Cinema, which is below. Yeah. It's still yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's locked. Yes. And, and I, 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 I've been in there. You've been in the St. Charles. Yeah. So, in, into the cinema. Yeah. And where, where all the seating is. Yeah. The, all the it, dust, the seating, the, the stench. What a great 
performance space that would be. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I mean, to bring, yeah. Yeah, you need to clean it up a bit. Uh, yeah. 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 But, Yalla, go. But F- the St. Charles, I think, is the name of the company that the family you're referring to. Yeah. That's the name of their... That's why, yeah, because it was built on the site of a, of a monastery that used to be there called right. the St. Charles. Yeah. Bodomeo um, Monastery, anyway. But then, Condo. over time, I stopped mm. seeing the Holiday Inn. Mm. I grew up here in the 90s in Beirut. I think like everyone that lives in Beirut, you stop seeing it. Mm. It just becomes part of the background and then you don't notice it anymore. And mm. today, literally, you go back and forth all the time. If you've lived here long enough, you know mm. where it is, but you don't think about it. It's there. Yeah, you become immune to it. It just yeah. disappears. Exactly. Although it's Sorry. huge. It's the largest structure in this country. Mm. And you don't yeah. see it. Uh, years and years ago, I think, <laughs> maybe during your first inter- interrogation by Hasbullah, yeah. um, I was giving walking tours mm. for about 15 years. I gave walking tours in Beirut. This was my favorite stop. Mm. I would spend so much time looking at this hotel from the outside, looking in, seeing graffiti, seeing carved militia names inside, mm. and looking back then at what was for a brief moment an unoccupied space there was a stretch of time as the syrians left in 2005 yeah and before the lebanese army took over wow there was a guy at the entrance with a mattress on the floor and a tv i don't know how he got electricity that was security for the holiday inn And week after week, I was taking 50, 60 people at a time, sometimes bigger groups, talking about this hotel, but dreaming of going inside. Mm. So I've shared this with my mom before, so it's okay to share it here again. Mm. I was younger. You can do this maybe when you're younger. You shouldn't do it when you're in your 40s. Well, it's it's never too late. Well, uh, now the thought of 24 floors is not a (laughs) piece. Yeah. Yeah. You can still do it, but it, it takes its toll. Yeah. I literally waited for this guy to fall asleep. No. And I had a Nokia phone. Mm. So the Nokia flashlight. You know mm. that thin phone? Yeah. yeah. I waited for this guy to sleep. I was yeah. with a friend of mine, a roommate. Actually, he's British. I don't know if that mm. had any. We're waiting and waiting for to hear him snore from the entrance on the backside, which is the Orient 499 shop. Yeah. We're waiting. We could start hearing him snore, which is like, okay, now's our chance. We hopped over a wall, jumped into the entrance, Mm. and tiptoed our way right by a sleeping security guard. Mm. And we made our way into the holiday. This Nokia flashlight, all I could see was hell inside the hotel. Mm. And at night, the holiday inn, Um, is a horrible place mm, yeah you can see it's been stripped it's completely bare but a lot of the hell that occupied the space it's there you Mm. just have to look a little close we went to the stairwell on the eastern end yeah that's the one i went up that's the one you went up i mean for the most part it's intact except there's giant holes that you can simply fall out of right Yes. Yeah. So yeah. we, because we're stupid and in our early, well, we're in our 20s, we decided, now let's risk it. Mm. Nokia flashlight. One floor after the next, each floor looking more miserable than the next. Mm. And we made our way to the rotating bar. Yeah. Trees, bats everywhere, mm. foul stench, and the most spectacular view of Beirut that you can only see from the Holiday Inn. Yes. So it's the black outline of a war-torn relic, and then behind it, the city. But it's a unique view. Oh, and and I painted it recently, the sunset from the top. Yes. Yeah, yeah, actually, earlier this year. You simply can't get that view anywhere else. Yeah. And we found the rotating bar, and we decided to walk in. That was Mm. the dumbest decision we made. Because Mm. you know the architect of, you know the engineering of the building, I didn't know the engineering of the building. It's two buildings side by side. Mm. It, there's actually, it's literally two structures with space in the middle. Right. Yeah. And when you strip the Holiday Inn bare, 
you remove that space in the middle. Yeah. So we're walking with our nuclear flashlight, looking around, and suddenly one of us is like, oh, that's the end. Mm. Maybe a meter gap. Mm. And you can fall 24 floors down. Mm. And fortunately, we didn't. Yeah. But I remember a feeling upstairs in the holiday and I haven't felt anywhere else. And it yeah. felt like felt like something committed suicide. Mm. But it's still there. Yes. Like anyone that commits suicide, they're still there. The presence, the spirits. Yes, the spirit of a city that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the Holiday Inn opened in that rare window of time. Mm -hmm. Just before this whole rosy picture that we keep trying to reclaim collapsed. It's months that this majestic building, yeah. and then suddenly, war-torn. Mm -hmm. I felt that in that building. I haven't felt it anywhere else. It's like a little pulse that still mm -hmm. pulsates inside. It's a very terrible feeling. Mm -hmm. You're seeing something you love and you're watching it in front of you, it takes over you and it kills itself in front of you too. Yeah. It's one of the worst experiences I've had. So I actually panicked. Yeah. The bats didn't scare me. Mm. The feta engravings yeah. everywhere. And the sniper. Um, the sniper carvings, the names, yeah. the, the dust. Nice. The handprints. The handprints. Mm. All That's that stuff that should scare someone to scary. death didn't scare me. What scared me was the building itself. So I grabbed my friend. I said, we have to go. Yeah. Ran downstairs. Now, running downstairs, we made it, rather than 24, we made it 25 floors. We mm. got into the old Syrian detention hallway. The Syrian army tortured people in the Holiday Inn, one floor below. Yeah. And it's there. Mm. It's all there. We went yeah. two floors down. We reached the swimming pool, yeah. which I never knew existed. Yeah, on the outside of the building, on the ground floor. Facing yeah. the Phoenicia, right yeah. next to the Phoenicia. Yeah. And I, I didn't know. There's, mm. You don't know because you've never seen it. Unless yeah. you're staying in the Phoenicia, maybe you can see it a bit. Yeah. We reached the pool, and I decided to not go into the St. Charles at that point. That's the one thing I decided, forget it. Mm. I'm not going to go there. The snow kid will not get me far. Mm -hmm. And maybe I don't want to. Mm. And we ran outside ran right by that guy who was snoring still he had no idea we were in the whole time mm -hmm. he didn't hear us run away no we ran and never went back in yeah and i think i saw what i needed to see in that hotel you can't yeah. reclaim something that died you can't that's that's true all but you can do you is can, you can know that it doesn't go away yeah and you can honor that. It, yeah. It's there, but physically you can't reclaim it. It's gone yeah. for good. That, yeah. that taught me something about Beirut too, that you shouldn't love it too much. Right. And yes. I kind of shifted what I was doing from then on. I mm. think I had a, a somewhat of a space between myself and what I thought was good for me, yeah. which was the city's history. Mm. No, maybe one step away is better. Yeah, did you did you find that perhaps some of those sort of almost naive, you know, feelings of hope and 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 a sense of renewal left you? Do you think that there was a sense of a reality, a sort of um, yeah, a sense that come on, let's let's not be so positive. Let's just face some sort of dark facts here. It got worse than that. I, I understood from then on, it took me, took me time really to appreciate this. That hotel is never going to be fixed. That's, well, that's, yeah. And if, that's it, strong and if it's brought down, I don't that. think it'll happen anytime soon either. Well, it, I mean, partly because it's so expensive to take it down. Expensive or not, you prime can't. real estate or not, yeah. I think that's the Beirut that we're staying with because the city killed itself. Right. And that possibly brings us on to also the sense of identification, but I see something exactly in, because that's what happened to my mother and yeah. sadly more recently my sister and 
that element of self-destruction is something that that I possibly I I I see and I I identify with too, and I'm trying to process. I'm trying to come to, come to terms with it. Um, I'm trying to hopefully harness that energy mm. and transform it into something meaningful and moving for myself and others mm. in some sort of healing journey. Um, but there, there's a, I mean, I, I'm interested in the theory of entropy, which is the second law, law of thermodynamics, where, you know, everything is in a constant state of decay. That's what happens in the universe, as, as far as scientists know that everything is in a constant state of decay. But in that process, shoots of new life, um, it produces an amazing, creative, positive, life-affirming energy comes off that process of, of, of decay. And I, and I find that in Lebanon, that, that essence of, um, of those two opposites and holding them both in balance. For sure, the, the decay and the darkness that you're talking about, mm. the sense of sort of doom, but this also, by the same token, uh, the, the, the also the, the, the kind of joyful, almost sense of energy and buzzing creativity. I mean, fi, like uh, electricity, you know, fi, actually, fi kaharaba katir. <laughs> on but <laughs> Mishman Dowley. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. It's it's something that, that uh, fizzes with creative potential as well. And um and maybe when I was in the holiday inn I felt also a sense of dread and darkness and I saw evidence of torture and those instruments and things that are still there and I maybe at night it's far more haunting because it's yeah you, it's maybe you, it's unexpected when you see certain things you're not looking for and then they're right in front of you maybe but I yeah. think a day or night it's yeah. a it's a it's it's it is, haunting yeah it is it's, haunting it's, it's, yeah. it has a presence and it's uh yeah it is it is a powerful building uh and it's uh yeah, exudes tremendous energy. And, and actually, I mean, I didn't run out, but as soon as I left the building, I got a constriction in my throat and I was quite ill for a few days and I mm. couldn't swallow or eat, in fact. And, and I think that was some possibly a sort of psychosomatic effect of being in the place and maybe even absorbing some of that energy that, that I'm talking about, uh, well, the, yeah, and maybe that is this is part of what I do in these old buildings, the Holiday Inn and others, um, the Rose House, Sulfur, the Grand Hotel, and and the Ro and um, uh, Villa Paradiso, and so on, is 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 sort of try to get out of my own way so that I I open up to the to this energy that's so presence in these so-called empty spaces and certainly i felt that in in the holiday inn but 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 having got recovered from this illness which was probably a response to this sort of horror of the mm -hmm. place um i've just set to work on 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 a lot of paintings yeah to, to sort of get it out of me to 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 yeah to transform it to release it and um share it with others uh yeah that that way of recalibrating whether it's through channeling that fear into work mm -hmm. or in my case it made me rethink my own relationship to the city mm. and expectations you can recalibrate them you can measure them differently and over time i simply don't notice it anymore Mm. like everyone else but i think it's safe to say that is the most haunting structure in this in this whole country there's nothing like the holiday inn 
Mm. And anyone that's been inside before the Lebanese army got in and after the Syrian army went in, there's a few of us that went in that window. Uh, yeah, it's maybe the last time you can get in without army uh, permission that you had. The, the un Who was calling the ambassador or the foreign office calling? Yeah, the general I, I, of the Lebanese yeah, army. I don't think Jose Fon is going to answer that phone call, to be honest, now. Well, he, well, he might. He might. He Actually, might. he's got one of my paintings up in his office. You're kidding me. So he might. Yeah, yeah this is another. So you I mean, really guarantee that you're going to have an exhibition there one day? Um, I'm working on it. You're you working know, on it. Strategy. <laughs> softly, softly. And it's, I mean, yeah, I, I was commissioned. I've worked with the Lebanese army quite a bit um, in my tour of, you know, military organizations. <laughs> um, um, that, yeah, no, I, I, did a, I did a painting of the, of the new border posts on the, that now protects, that were built to protect Lebanon from Daesh near, near all along the the border of Lebanon and so I did the, the Lebanese army commissioned me uh, so was, I, once he becomes president you'll be in Babda painting him yeah. <laughs> but I well I, mm, one more Tom no bullet well would you like me nude <laughs> hey, 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 well, okay come on let, now now that would be terrifying <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah Ziad <laughs> yeah. on tour yeah, yeah. Jihad Wayna. No. So, <laughs> keep painting, my friend. Okay. So, we'll wrap it up oh, with this. more recent uh, work that you've done. I'm just going to share three other exhibition pamphlets. I really got to know you through Carousel, which is going years back. Maybe I can just ask you to pick that up. The Rose House, we all know, and Grand Sofa Hotel. Grand Sofa oh. Hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that really is a fast forwarding of the exhibitions that brought you to October 17. Uh -huh. And that portrait right in the middle, is, yeah. is that from 2020? Yeah, it's actually 2021. 2021. It's, it's the huge gathering um, on the one year anniversary of, of the explosion. Right. The, the, the gathering of maybe half a million people by the port, which I found was amazing, a very solemn and respectful, compassionate gathering. But people were very angry, obviously, still are. And the painting is called Badna al Haia. you know, we want the truth, but, but obviously, you know, no investigation is, is, is really being done and probably never will be. But the desire for justice and truth is alive, is true. And I wanted to paint that. Yeah, it was a moment, again, of, of, of great suffering, but also camaraderie and a, and a real soul. You know, a feeling of, of perhaps what a defining moment of what Lebanon really is or could be. You know, people coming together with a common desire for justice and accountability and and shared, sort of shared suffering, which was incredibly moving to, to witness. And, and I saw you that day. I was going to say, yeah. We, we met in the crowds, yeah. yeah. And because and I'd had my own house and studio completely smashed to pieces and many paintings torn and, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I wasn't just observing this. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm sort of, I've experienced this firsthand as well. And, you know, one of, you know, possibly the only neighborhood that I've ever really been able to call my home in Jamezi suffered really the most uh, where we are now. And, uh, yeah, so I really felt strongly about that. And, and what is art all about if, if it's not about emotion and feeling? That's, 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 uh, so yeah, that painting is about a lot of things, um, and and the spirit of of the attempted Thaura process movement of two thousand and nineteen, as well. You know that that same spirit that that sort of came to life again that that day, and and sometimes, you know, does uh, come up again in in the public consciousness. 
you spent most of your time in Beirut living in this neighborhood, or a, mm. a huge chunk of it is literally just up the yeah. street. Uh, apart from when I'm not in various, you know, jails. When you're not in jail, you're here in Jamaica. Or, or, or Saida, which is... Or Saida, yes. Should be a different planet right? To, to where we are now. Or when you're in the mountains painting, or for that matter, the Rose House in Ras Beirut. But I associate you with this neighborhood. Mm. Yeah. Pre, pre-blast, post-blast. And I know that, I mean, I've seen it on, with my own eyes. Some of your work damaged by the blast, oftentimes on display. Mm. So I've seen your work hurt by the blast too. And this portrait of Jamezi, is this recent? Yeah, actually, this is earlier this year. Earlier this year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, almost with, with some of the buildings repaired. Again, it's, it's the painting of, and it's, you know, it's just the, there's a sense of light that I wanted to, and softness that I wanted to portray as well in that. You know, that, that incredible feeling when you see things coming back to life, you know, well, possibly like this, you know. Yeah, the sense of renewal and rebirth, uh, which is amazing to be a part of. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's important to really honor, to honor and celebrate that as an artist. As important as it is to deal with the darkness and the the pain that we were talking about in the Holiday Inn, they 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 have a symbiotic relationship. You know, almost one cannot exist without the other. Uh, what happens to your work when where you're working? becomes part of the story. Mm. I left Beirut for four years. I got way too close to the stuff I was talking about, the Holiday Inn, on a personal level, and mm. I decided to leave this country for four years as someone who associates fully with Lebanon. Mm. The yeah. blast, destroying your home, yeah. damaging your work, and I'm sure leaving a permanent scar on you as well does it do the opposite for you well because from uh, what i know you have not left this country for long periods of time in any no. recent stretch no i've seen you in every single gathering mm. i saw you in the october 17 protests i recorded with you in november that year we were together during that protest one year anniversary and I regularly run into you, and I know that you're a fixture here. Mm. Yeah. Is that just how you decide to make your work better reflect the moment? Y yeah, I think, you, well, it, it is a sense of commitment to something, to a place. You know, I'm not just, a, as they say, a fair weather friend. Uh, and if you, if you truly love someone or something or a place, you know, when they're ill, you know, you don't abandon them. Or at least, well, one hopes not. Um, so, in a sense, because it is suffering, that made me want to stay even more, mm. actually. And there are, there are so many others who, who, are, who are really trying to respond posit positively and creatively to this, to this difficult situation we're, we're in. And, and it's, it's, a lovely, it's, it's amazing to be a part of that. Um, and I guess to feel a sense of purpose to mm. some extent. That's what we're all looking for, the sense of meaning and purpose. And, and you could be living in the most you know, affluent, you know, functional place, but, but be lacking a purpose. And, and so I think, yeah, I mean, it depends how you assess happiness and what, and what, and what meaning really is. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I feel a sense of meaning and purpose and emotion here that I don't feel elsewhere. And, and, and possibly also because I experienced, well, in 2019, my sister, who, who I was loved very dearly, took her own life. And, and that was so devastating that in a way, anything that happened after that, you know, kind of wasn't, it sort of, it, it was like, come on, 
bring it on. You know, what, what, what more can happen? Okay, the house blown up. Lose all my money. <laughs> you know, one thing after another. Um, and just, just, just sort of go through it, feel it, but also witness it, process it. Um, but yes, I think probably because, because in my own personal life I'd been through, yes, yeah, some really, really difficult times that... When you say, it, when you it's say, like nothing phased me. But I when you know. say bring it, everything is going wrong. Keep bringing it. Does it, does it improve your work? And through um, your eyes, not through the audience, not through collectors, not through the no, novice art appreciation crowd, for you, does it actually improve your work on a personal level? You know, it probably does, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it, it's so... Um, Yeah, as an artist, uh, I want to make the best work that I can and, and to share that with, with people as a mirror or, or some sort of filter for the, for the emotions that we all feel. Um, so yeah, I want to be in the best place to make the best work. Um, and okay, maybe there's, there's, there's electricity shortages and I've lost my money and uh, but there are more important things than that but again maybe I'm in a privileged position to be able to make that call uh, because you know I'm a white guy with a with a British passport maybe okay I, I, I acknowledge that but but that's the truth that's that's the situation I'm in and And it's just, just being here, it, yeah, is a way to, for me to process so many things um, that are going on around me in Lebanon and are deep inside of me. It's a strange trait when you find heaven and hell, mm. and I do as well. Yeah. And I think that's what happens when you're in love with this place. I mm. do often try, and it doesn't always work, to keep one step removed from, from the tragedy yeah. and not get too close to the wounds always. And not mm. dwell on the pain. Yeah. There Cause, we go. Yeah, because I think that can have a counterproductive effect. Yeah, you can over-identify exactly. yourself yeah. with the pain. Yes, and that, yeah, that that can be a bit of a rabbit hole. And I think that's yeah. the what I was trying to get at when I walked into this monster here. You don't want to identify with that. No, it's not good for you. But. But you can honor it, and you can yeah. examine it to a point, but don't right. become that. Don't become it. Yeah. But, but it's also a mistake to disassociate too much from it. Yeah. Because that is what they call a spiritual bypass. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you know, oh, it never happens. You know, there is no me. There's no ego. It's all, you know, it's all an illusion. Well, mm, I'm not really sure about that. I think, you know, we've got to honor our, our humanness yeah. and our, our story, you know, can be our glory. There's no better way to wrap it up other than that quote. <laughs> I will also say it's obviously not just wounds and tragedy or markers of anniversaries that you paint. You paint individuals and you're very talented at that you also paint landscape and you've done quite a number of those beautiful paintings in the back of mm. majestic scenes across the country yeah and yeah, i think it is yes beautiful. yeah and, and i think it's nice that people associate you with all of the above and mm. you found your way to make lebanon home and i think the art scene would be at a disservice without you so i'm glad you're sticking around permanently i'd like to fade in the sunset with you yeah You're so well, let's take a 10 minute break. We can order drinks and then we'll have a Q &A yeah. afterwards. Thank Great. you, Tom. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie.
and we're back. So just before we get to the q and I'm going to share with the audience some forged currency Tom produces. Yeah. He rips off foreigners at the airport. Uh, yeah. These are dollar equivalency Lawler notes. Uh, so we've got, let's see, we've got a defunct train, traffic, trash, forest fires, uh, <laughs> a candle, <laughs> a, a, candle. A, a blacked out city, and tragedy, of course, port blast. But just to show you the effort Tom makes when trying to get foreigners to do money exchange. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that yes well i you know i lost all my money so i thought i had to make some some new stuff um you know i should have mentioned it one of those notes if if is it the 51 that you were going to put the central bank on the back yeah actually all of them all uh, of them yeah were supposed to have the central bank in you know kantari hamra yes um yeah. And we were concerned. I was doing it in association with uh, Leah Burnett, the, mm. uh, and they had a project to do an anti-corruption campaign for the Lebanese Transparency Association, who are a kind of economic political lobby group mm. um, with some very smart, you know, people with great intentions um, to produce, yeah, these Lola notes, the currency of corruption. To I, you know, as as a campaign just before the general elections in Lebanon last year, so it was just to provoke people's yep. sense of like concern and also outrage at what the political elites had been doing in Lebanon, and um, but was and the notion that come on, this needs to change. Well, uh, instead of the central bank, you ended up doing. The Holiday Inn. Ah, right, that's right. And they, so the legal team for, for were, were concerned, had very real concerns that the legal lawyers for the central bank would sue us or, or possibly take legal action against us for representing the central bank of Lebanon architecturally. Mm. Um, and so I was told to change the painting at the last moment, just before we went to print, to, to make the notes. Right. And, uh, and we made about 20,000 of these banknotes and, and made ATMs specially designed and set them up uh, in different locations around Beirut um, so that people could come and withdraw their lollas, you know, freely. Um, and... And it was reviewed every night on LBC main evening news wow. um, on the business reports. <laughs> so the Lola notes went up on the big screen. And it, so it, it really kind of, in a way, pierced the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of mainstream media, yeah. this project, as a kind of anti-corruption uh, artistic hijack, almost. Uh, and... Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great thing to be involved in. And again, to, to push the boundaries of, of what arts could do, can do. Um, and, to, and to make Lawler itself to, tangible to, rather than yeah. just a, a nickname for... Right, to make it into an actual note and, it, and, and to show the dysfunction that's going on, to make it into something real and recognizable through traditional somewhat romantic art which i make um and to show on 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 a currency not what's good about the country but in fact what's bad about it or what's going wrong so totally reverse what money usually is yeah. and also they're limited edition prints of my artwork so they have to some extent an intrinsic value which you know dollars and pounds and euros don't have they're just bits of notes they're, they're just bits of paper so it, in a way it kind of questions why do we ascribe value to bits of paper that in themselves have no value what, what you know what is value 
Um, so, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting project. But, yeah, it, it, was, to, it, it was motivated by concern for Lebanon and, and, and we want to, to, you know, shine a light. It on. looks better than our own currency. <laughs> yes. It's true. It's an attractive print. Of course, tragedy is on it, mm. but the design itself is actually quite appealing. Mm. I, I, I have my own collection of Lawler notes. Yeah. It's, it's the first time I've seen your art displayed that way. That right. kind of creative lens that's not a traditional painting by Tom Young. This yeah. is now currency <laughs> by Tom Young. <laughs> painting money and and <laughs> and then you know exhibiting my work not in in um in old abandoned buildings but in atms right exactly. so, yeah interesting on that note ha <laughs> <laughs> there you go let's yeah. open it to audience q a please ask whatever you'd like uh i guess everything is okay we can go into the personal political art Maybe a bit of what it's like to be an artist right now surviving Lebanese economy. So anything you'd like. Is yeah. there anyone? Yes, please. The lady. Just Yeah. It's like, like, yeah. I actually have a small comment on what both of you said about Beirut. Um, seeing that you said when you went into the holiday ill, you saw kind of Beirut, how it attempted, how it died by suicide. It killed its own self because of the very harsh history that it has gone through. But I don't know. I know we always compare Beirut to a phoenix that's dying and also always reviving. But personally, I feel like Beirut has transcended life and death because right now it's not that we are here the buildings have rebuilt itself but at the same time it's not alive so i don't know i think this is what attracts people to beirut this is what attracts me to beirut is this it, it has transcended life and death it has transcended everything it's not a phoenix it's not resilience it's beirut so it's its own thing so i don't know what you you think about that mm. you want to go first you go? well i yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you, actually. I think it, I, I, I couldn't have said it better, really. I mean, it's, and I totally agree with you as well that, that the word resilience and, and the idea of the phoenix, we've heard it enough. It's such a cliche and it's, and it almost excuse, excuses the sort of, you know, the abuse that continues. It's like, oh, don't worry about the Lebanese, they're, they're resilient. It's, Callous enough. I mean, you know, um, and and I think that definitely Lebanon, the spirit I feel here is just so much more than that. Uh, it's it's so much deeper than these predictable cliches. Um, and um, yeah, I I don't know whether there is a word for it. I mean, maybe that's why I paint because I there are no words for it. It's. Yeah, it's something deep and beautiful and amazing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's inspiring. It could be all of the above. With art, with words, with poetry, with everything, we try to fill this void of this unknown of what Beirut is. Because it's a blank space, personally, my own opinion, but because it's a blank space, it's like a blank canvas and you just throw things at it from your own history. Like what I live, my Beirut is different from someone else's Beirut, yeah. especially seeing that I'm someone that's not from Beirut. I haven't lived in Beirut, so I see it maybe in these rose colored glasses. But yeah, I, yeah. I like to think that Beirut is a blank canvas where we can just throw things at it and just stick and be but its thing. There's something that's paralyzed. There's something that's frozen. Yeah. And I think that structure mm. I think it maybe because it's more limited to this building I think it leans heavier on death rather than rejuvenation in life because I, I looked for anything positive in this story I, I simply can't find it there's nothing rosy about what happened to to the holiday and but may, maybe no. paralysis is that word as well yeah you can be frozen in time and look yeah. like you're dead that's part of it yeah, that's just one element of the mosaic. Yeah. It's not all paralyzed, but paralyzed paralysis is is a part of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, paralysis, joy, pain, all of it. The yeah. it's, it's wow. But well, thank you for that question. Yeah, is there anyone else? Yes, the lady in the front. Hello. Hi. Um, 
I am also an artist, and I feel like being in Beirut, uh, like I feel the inspir, like it's very inspirational in a way. And there's a lot to, there's so much emotion here to sort of make work from. But I've felt like I've been here for two years, and I've been in a two-year rut where I have not made a single thing, despite being in this place. Yeah. With so, I, and I feel like for me, I'm afraid that uh, to tell a story that's not mine. Right. So I'm wondering if that's ever something that you felt or if like, I know you've been here like much longer and experienced things that I haven't, yeah. but if that's ever something like mm. people have thought about your work or something that you felt, or if you have any advice to sort of like get over that hurdle. Cause a lot of artists I have spoken to and people in Beirut have encouraged me to make work <laughs> about this place, but there's still yeah. something that's stopping me. So I'm just wondering if there's something if you've ever felt something like that, or if you have any advice. That's a, that's a very, very good point. Yeah. And it, it does occur to me as what well, definitely the, the, the notion of not, you know, avoiding making work that's not about your story. I guess maybe as I was saying in the first part of the, the talk, that, um, that to some extent all of my paintings of Beirut is my story. Uh, because I see my, myself and my, my inner life and my, many of my experiences uh, almost projected on a giant scale. And that may seem far-fetched. And to some people, maybe it could be even a bit offensive because people might look at me and go, oh, well, you're a white guy with a British passport. You don't know what it's like. And that's valid. Maybe that's, I accept that. But, but I'm painting my truth when I paint Lebanon. And so it kind of is, it, it's a way for me to process my story, um, as well as the stories of Beirut that I feel have been hidden or erased often, um, because there is no agreed upon history. Because it's you know um, you know the history books are are uh, cannot be written because of all of these different narratives. So perhaps I'm not saying giving people. Or I I hope I don't say this is what happened, you know, <laughs> um, because we don't really know. I'm I'm hopefully making art that maybe asks provokes some questions and leaves space for interpretation rather than rather than dictating some sort of answer or ultimate truth because it doesn't exist particularly here i mean there's so as you say there's so many different truths here yeah as khalil gibran said you know i have my lebanon and you have yours and within my Lebanon, there are several, several Lebanons. <laughs> it's so complicated. Maybe honor that complexity. Or maybe even, I, I, as an artist, actually, I, um, um, one thing might be to embrace that confusion instead of resist it. So um, maybe I'm just throwing an idea out there but maybe make uh, art about being con about being in a rut <laughs> you know you know go uh, step outside it one 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 level i i actually in 2021 i was going back to england a lot because my father had a stroke so i was going back and helping him so i was you know i didn't know where i belonged because i was back and forth boom 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 and then I thought, why, how interesting. Why don't I make a painting about, about being confused about where I belong? So I'd made some paintings that combined both London and Beirut, literally switching between the two. Um, so instead of deny the confusion and look for belonging, uh, actually embrace the fact that I don't know where I belong and that's okay <laughs> I will plug something on Tom's behalf again I keep referring to it watch the MTV podcast episode from two weeks ago Tom has a fascinating family connection to Lebanon 
as well, which is a it's it's so poetic. This link to the city uh, to to this country from World War II. So watch that episode, and you can, mm. I think, better understand why Tom can never be in any other country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's part it, of your motherland uh, exhibition is, as well. It is. I mean, I could say I could I could quickly say it. I would, sure. Maybe. Yeah. I. Yeah, actually, I I discovered fourteen years after being here. I'd always wondered, what is this connection? There's no family connection here for me at all. This is just a projection. Um, but actually, it turns out that um, in 1943, when Lebanon so-called became an independent country, um, in the height of the struggle for the battle for independence, um, there was a very eccentric and um, sort of kind of rebellious British general, it turns out, who who went out of his way to, let's say, assist the, the Lebanese in their quest for independence to remove the French. And in fact, he was fired for doing it. So it's not as if the British even supported him, but a guy called General Spears. And there's a street in, in, in the Hamra named, named after him. But his military advisor at the height of the crisis which led to independence was my mother's cousin and I never knew <laughs> until last year um, and in fact this guy Colonel um, Sir Giles Isham um, was the man who introduced my parents my, my parents met in his house in England uh, a place called Lamport in Northamptonshire and um, and in his in, in, in his house, where, where my mother was living with her three children, um, one of whom was my brother Charlie, and his son, Jack, is here tonight. <laughs> There's another connection. Here we go. Um, and my brother Charlie helped introduce my parents. And, and, and it was all in the house of this guy who was in Lebanon in 1943. And I had no idea. Uh, it was this bizarre uh, kind of link, really, that maybe, maybe a little hint that sometimes you get in life that, no, maybe, yeah, you're on the right path here. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Thanks for letting me touch on that. Are there more yeah. questions? Yes. The front. Yes. yes. Uh, in, in talking about uh, Lebanon, uh, you know, most most of the Lebanese, or not most, but a lot of Lebanese are leaving now. And uh, as uh, uh, Nassim Talib in his book, uh, he describes what how we excel outside of Lebanon and how we do better, and we're one of the most uh, successful uh, immigrants, maybe, uh, where, uh, where we go. But Can you uh, bring it just a little closer? And this is, he describes it as anti-fragile is uh, we excel outside is is that the case for you being in lebanon as opposed of doing your work somewhere yeah. else that's do, that do you is excel a good point. Here? yeah yes yeah i think i think i think i do lebanon brings out the best best in me and yeah i'm i'm really grateful for that so that's why maybe i i want to keep on giving back because it, it it gives me so much and uh and there is also, there's a, a, a bit of a tradition as well from Britain that there's a tradition of these, let's say, intrepid travelers who, who go and settle in, in other countries. And maybe what I do is part of that tradition as well, possibly from, like the Lebanese, the British are famous global travelers and not always in a very nice way, as, as, as we know. As you know, um, often doing more damage th than, than than good. But um, yeah, so so yeah, I, I I do feel I do better, deeper work here than I ever did in in England. That's for sure. But now, when I go back to England, I think I think I could I could use what I've what Lebanon has opened up for me to maybe see my own lands in a different way. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? But 
but there are a lot more restrictions and licenses that you need. Uh, too, too, too much, you know, of a system. Ktia Nizam, too much. <laughs> uh, you should give talks in the UK about too much red tape. Yeah. 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 I think yes. we've all experienced it trying to apply for tourist visas to the UK. Yeah. Well, Even that's you know. a okay. journey. Well, if the painting doesn't work out, yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Samer, yeah. you had a question. Yeah. So, uh, many foreigners come here and they become part of Lebanon. They become, for lack of a better way of saying it, Lebanized. Lebanese, whatever. Um, Robert Fisk, you, many others. Uh, many others not as famous as well. Um, what is it about this place that makes you care so much, feel that you belong and even fight for it through various forms of activism when many Lebanese themselves simply don't care about this place? Gosh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I guess I just act on instincts from feeling, maybe. I can't even give a really rational, intellectual answer to that, um, maybe. I just feel, I feel deeply for Lebanon. And maybe for all of those reasons of identification that I spoke about, um, it's a feeling of empathy, perhaps, uh, that comes through my own personal experience. Uh, and having lived here for 14 years, yeah, I, I've, 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 I've suffered a lot of these crises directly myself. So it's beyond nationality. It's, uh, it's beyond this concept we have of nations and flags. It's just about... Um, relating to other human beings in a, just a different part of the world and, and, uh, and really trying to be part of something meaningful and creative and hopefully positive. Um, and I think there's so much injustice as well. I mean, I, I think that there's so much talent and, uh, passion and, and creativity here and it's so misrepresented in the world's media as well, Lebanon and, and it's and also the, the, the you know, badly led within Lebanon, you know, you know, you know the leaders, the corruption the, um, it's, it's, it's there's something deeply unjust about that and I guess, yeah, I was brought up maybe to believe in justice um, into and I, I, I feel I'd like to be a part of, of um, yeah of, of this revival and um, and and blooming of life here uh, it's uh, and the more that it suffers the more that it's it's threatens the more that I want to kick back and you know create almost yeah it's uh who knows why or maybe maybe like the druze say i was here before i don't know, I don't know. who knows <laughs> uh william Thanks. has a question hey yeah uh two questions <laughs> if that's okay of course. Yeah. First one, have you um, maybe had a conversation with Riyad Salemi and kind of the advice might be to get Lebanon out of this hole, to, to move away from the fiat currency yeah. and have one backed by uh, Tom Young art? Yeah. You have the Tom Young standard as a way to uh, <laughs> yeah. a deflationary system. Um, yeah. I guess the other question is more related to a follow on from, from Samir and something that. You know, I think I sometimes struggle with living here and you, one can be, you know, poetic and one can, you know, reach inside and try and work out what it is about this country that's beguiling or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or makes you want to stay here. At, at what point is it, is it just a bit more prosaic than that and just the, the deep advantage of 
you know, the ability to be a, a big fish in a, in a very small pond. And, mm. and at what point, I guess, is, is, you know, the fear of leaving and becoming a very small fish in a very, a very big pond. And, and, yeah. and, and is that something that you have to grapple with as well? Yeah. That, well, that is a good point. Yeah, possibly there is a fear of going back to London. And I do sometimes, and I do exhibitions in London, and I've done one in New York as well uh, in recent years. And, and it is, yeah, it's always a bit of a, uh, a tough thing to swallow to realise how, yeah, unknown I am outside of Lebanon uh, in many ways. Although, yeah, pr probably better known now than I was when I was in London. But, but you know, who, what does it really matter to be known or not to be known? I don't know. As long as you're, you're finding fulfillment in what you create with your own hands, you know, whether you get affirmation from others or not. I wonder how much that really matters to me now. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it would if I tried. I don't know. But I, I um, yeah, yeah, it is a bit of a comfort zone, ironically, now, you know, Lebanon. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it is lovely to be, to be valued and to get that love back. The love that I'm giving, to see it coming back is, is, is a lovely experience. Uh, and so, you know, as we say, as we say in England, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> um, um, but if, if I did, if there was, you know, if I did suddenly have to leave, then there would be, then that would be a new challenge if I had to remake my life and career in London or, or anywhere else. Then that would be what would be happening. I mean... You, we, both, you, know, you both have created wonderful legacies in this city. You've contributed to the art scene immensely. And William, you've given us one of the best places in Beirut. Alia's is superb. Could you do this in the, in the UK? Would you be able to rebuild something like this technically where you're from? No. No. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but could, I, could I ask you a yeah. follow-up? Do you have that same, let's say, reasoning as Tom does, that it just doesn't make sense there for you, but it makes perfect sense here? Well, I think, you know, maybe a recent experience of going back to England for two and a half years and saying what I did in Lebanon and the reaction being kind of how twee. And, and that felt very kind of um, almost kind of uh, constant. And, and so the idea of kind of trying to explain what you did in a city that people don't care about and people aren't impressed about because they assume that it's easy to go and to do something in Beirut, I guess on some level, both correctly and incorrectly. I mean, you know, there's the, as Tom said, the red tape, but I guess if you have a business in, in, in the UK, you don't necessarily have to worry about it being destroyed in an explosion or you know, 2,000% inflation on, on energy bills within the space of three months. Um, but I think, you know, from my perspective, it, you know, it is easier to, to be a big fish here than it is in London as 8 million people. Um, and I guess if you'd started from the beginning, then that's one thing, but to go back, having been here for 10 years and try and explain that to, to people there, I find that, well, I found that, you know, really, really difficult. Um, and so I guess that was where the, the question came from. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe my answer is would is perhaps a bit easier, and and that is yes, I do quite like being, let's say, I don't know how much of a big fish, but a but a recognised fish in a small pond, and uh, and that's nice. So, thank you very much, Lebanon. Simple as that. I think Munir has a question in the back. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for beautiful conversations. Um, yeah. I'm a big believer in the value of art and all sorts of different aspects of art uh, in this process of, of culture shift and building a more positive culture. And that could be painting, poetry, music, literature, dance, etc. Except that I feel like the potential 
of art to be a vector for that kind of positive social change is largely underappreciated and underrealized. And we're having a lot of cultural challenges here in Lebanon and also around the world. And, um, and somehow we're not building that momentum towards positive culture shift that I think we really can. And I'm curious your thoughts on why of, you know, your, your art obviously has a strong social mission, social aspect to it. Mm. Um, how can we really build momentum to support more of this social impact art and have, you know, a movement of creators, a movement of appreciators, a movement of this kind of culture shift. Um, yeah, what's, what's missing there? Wow. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Maybe slightly out of my hands as, a, as a, just an individual practitioner of, of, of art myself. But maybe, you know, maybe an organization that, that, that kind of brings different cultural organizations together. Um, and more organization from the cultural scene itself, some practical support, uh, like an umbrella organization that can bring, you know, different cultural groups and practitioners together. And more education as well. It's, it's the kids, you know, that's those... Yeah, we have a cultural emergency. Yeah, we, we have a, yeah. So, yeah, no education. And I try to do as much as I can. I, I go to schools and give big, big lectures and, you know, in lecture halls and, and I do screenings. And, and I think we all just need to wake up every morning and ask ourselves, what can I do today to help? Uh, is what I'm going to do today part of the solution or is it part of a problem? And just, you know, yeah, do what we can. Um, but yeah, more, more kind of structural cohesion between, bet across Lebanon and across different cities and towns and all these sectarian sort of groups bring, bring us together in a way that religions and politicians clearly don't. Uh, and yeah, this is, this is the way the cultural shift can then change perhaps the, the political scene um, through the back door or, or, or through the ground up. Um, yeah, through, through children and, and, and education. Yeah. Cool. The lady in the middle? Or, yes. Yeah, I would like to know, do you ever give a workshop, art workshop? I'm fascinated by the beautiful architectural rendering of your paintings. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I didn't know that you had an architectural background. And uh, just, mm. you know, I'm just interested if you give workshops about, yeah. um, you know, yeah. that kind of uh, paintings. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, d I do sometimes, and I, but I usually give workshops actually to groups of children, school kids and architectural students who come to my projects. Um, I'm doing current exhibition in, in Saida in Hamam al-Jadid in a beautiful old bath, bathhouse in, in the souk there. And I, and I teach local kids there. And, I, that, and that I find important because let's say that part of Lebanon and, and side in particularly in particular you know there isn't much cultural appreciation and and there's a lot of very conservative opinions there towards culture and so that's where I feel it's needed um, and I teach often in orphanages and um, to groups of refugees as well but um, but in terms of like proper courses for adults who just, we all simply, yeah, I mean, you know, we all uh, deserve to be given the chance to, to, to be creative, to process our feelings, not just, you know, disadvantaged children. Um, so it's a good point. And I'd like to run courses, actually, maybe from my studio here in Jamezi, which is a beautiful space, which I'm going to use more. 
so maybe we yeah we'll 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 exchange contacts and and I'll I'll um I'll announce it on my on my Insta, on my social media pages when when I do um, and maybe long term set up some kind of school or foundation where that could be a base for both children and adults who want to learn so yeah for sure I will I think we have a DJ right behind you playing music right. Uh, oh yeah somebody's right. blasting their music bring him in bring him in <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> are there other questions yep. yes please hi uh, so we've been talking about the present and the truth a lot so i want to jump into the imagination a bit and ask if uh, if let's say you could do a painting you'd create a painting today about beirut and magically make it reality uh, what would you paint oh wow yeah, well, I, I suppose in a sense, maybe this one behind me is a, is a good place to start because this doesn't exist, in fact. It's a vision of a garden, a green space that, that could exist if there was the, the will and the, the, um, the support for such a, a garden. So, yeah, I'd say if I was to paint a Beirut that I would like to see it would be a Beirut that had more gardens and more green space and more spaces for contemplation and reflection um, and so yeah it would be greener and there'd be more flowers and trees and uh, gardens and public space yeah places where people could gather um, yeah thank you yeah good 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 thinking Thanks. Was there another question? The lady in the front? Yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you find your voice as an artist? Since um, it was a very long journey, did yeah. you always know that you wanted to draw these paintings or did you find your voice along the way? And if yes, how? Yeah, good good point i guess i always i it was an instinct it almost like breathing when i was very young about three or four years old yeah i just knew that i loved drawing and painting and uh, luckily i had um a lot of support from my family uh, that maybe my family may have been divided and uh, had lots of tragedies and conflicts um along the way but at least artistically, every single one of my family has supported me 100% um, as an artist. Uh, so that's been amazing. And I would recommend, if there are any parents out there listening to, if your child shows some sign of artistic or musical talents, then please support them, because it's so important that um, that, that, you know, children and the youth are, are supported. Uh, and in, in, yeah, to find, to follow their true path, really. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, through support. Uh, yeah, my, my grandmother was an artist. She, she used to take me out painting. That, that had a big effect in waking me up. Um, and, um, yeah, and I think, I think after the sort of, uh, yeah, sadnesses and, and tragedies that happened to me, around me, that that woke me up as an artist too. It was, it, I suddenly realized I had this, this thing, this way to process emotions. So actually, yeah, both from positive things and so-called negative things, it, it, it was pushing me all the time. And then... I'd say coming to Lebanon. That's what totally woke me up as an artist. Um, I'd been somewhat asleep, I think, really, when I was in, in England and France and Italy and other places. Um, I didn't, I was a bit lost, but it was here that I found my essence, or all my essence was revealed. It, 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 it was there all the time. Um, so, yeah. It, it's, yeah, I woke up here. 
Thanks. Bye. Other questions? Mm. Oh, Zena in the back. And maybe this can be the final question. So about the Holiday Inn, if Mm. it's too expensive to bring down, um, what do you envision it becoming in the future if we had like proper urban planning policies? Um, I remember during the Walk Beirut tour years ago with Ronnie, Ronnie said that um, the, the Holiday Inn will never become the Holiday Inn again until there's absolute stability in Lebanon. So once you see it I being said, rebuilt... I, when did I say yeah, that? That yeah, sounds great. Saying, yeah. <laughs> so once yeah. you see oh, it being rebuilt, yes. then that means Lebanon is in good hands finally. Yes. I remember that very clearly. Huh. So I don't know if there will ever be investment in, in that hotel. Um, but it seems a shame to bring it down as well and probably too expensive. So what would you imagine it becoming? Gosh, that, yeah, good, good question. I mean, it could become now an amazing light installation, actually, (laughs) without changing the building at all. I mean, that could be incredible, you know, to fill it full of lights on every floor and or maybe do projections on it to have it as some kind of beacon in the center of the city uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, installation. Um, that could be amazing. Uh, and a garden around the base of it, as, as I depicted here, that, that could be another thing. Um, but, you know, the, I mean, the, because it's a tower and it's uh, a... Str- uh, the high points in the city are all strategic um, because of the memories of the Civil War. Yeah, the army, to some extent, are always going to be there unless it becomes something else. Um, so that is, yeah, that's complicated. How would you get them out? Because um, everyone is terrified of, of people the wrong wrong people getting in and then they have a high vantage point um and um so yeah we'd have to be in conjunction with the lebanese army to begin with in the transition um and i'm working on that um but um it could be well it could be a an amazing museum of memory you know in in a way that perhaps Beirut could be but isn't yet Um, that would be an amazing place Um, a place of education and uh, to bring children to learn about history and um, that could be amazing Um, a bit grim for a kid probably Um, but I don't know. I'll give my own. I know the, yeah. the question wasn't for me, but I'll... Yeah, Ronnie, go, go uh, for it. So let's say there's two options. One is the rest of our lives. The other one is the parallel universe. Mm. All right, I'll start with our current pretty, re- our reality. Real. I think what we have serves a valuable function in that it's a stark reminder, even when hotels are being reopened, like the Phoenicia a few months ago, or the Four Seasons, I think, in a few weeks, is reopening. Perhaps Le Gre- Are you taking a photo of me? I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, Sneaky. My whole five years of podcasting, no one's ever done that. Thank you. <laughs> the guest just takes a... When I'm turned. Thanks for that. I want you're, that you're photo. <laughs> <laughs> well, not... Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, no, <laughs> everyone's taking photos now. <laughs> it, it's taking photograph of me taking. Yeah, there, uh, there, and then William yeah. does it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a you know theater. You know, it, it's a multi arts event. You know, this is this is performance art. <laughs> right. Anyway. No, no, where were we? I have no idea. Where were we? Oh yeah. For thank you. Four seasons. Yes. Four seasons. Or or for that matter, uh, let's say Le Grey reopens by next tourism season. That's a good reminder that despite uh, short periods of economic gain, 
the biggest hotel remains in its mess. I think that's a healthy reminder. So it does naturally serve that function. Right. It, it also serves another function in that you can't do anything with it physically. It's too yeah. late. It's too, there it, are too many expensive tower blocks around it yes. that would be damaged if you demolish the foundations to bring it down. Right. So it has to be taken, it has to be demolished from the top down, floor by floor. Yes, exactly. And I gather, I mean, it's, that would be exactly far too expensive and logistically right. almost impossible to do. Yeah. And so it's stuck. It, exactly. It's it, stuck it, the it's, way I think the, uh, she left now, but talking about paralysis, yeah. it's too expensive to knock it down, mm. to make Beirut look aesthetically less Civil War-ish. Mm. Um, and rehabilitating it, turning it into condominiums or whatever, mm. get Bernard Khoury to play with it, I, that, that yeah. I think, is more expensive. And also, the, the, the ceiling heights are too yes. low. Right. Apart from on the top floor and the, the ground floor, yeah. they're only you know, two meters high, yeah. which is incredibly low. It's about two meters, 250. Yeah. It's a suffocating experience to be in there, actually. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so if, any, if the structure was kept, I would recommend knocking down half of the floors, demolishing them so you had double mm. heights. I mean, that would be incredibly expensive, but would the be whole, amazing. Yeah, so then you're running into logistics, money, uh, and then who the hell would do that, given where we are right now anyway? So let's say reality is it serves its natural function. It's 1975 through to 2023. That's a function in itself. The parallel universe option, I think, personally, I think this disaster, the Holiday Inn, should be kept the way it is. Untouched. Yeah. You can walk in if you want. There's some protection. For people that want to get in, obviously, you're not going to let people fall out of the Holiday Inn or fall in. Mm. But I think it's well past time to think of rebuilding it, rehabilitating it, making yeah. it anything else. I think at this point, yeah. this thing should stay the way it is. And as an art installation, downstairs, and maybe a light installation in the floors above, yeah, could be done. But the thing is, the difference between these two options, even though one is reality and one is parallel universe, is that in the parallel story, this finally serves its true function, which is it's only a reminder. Yeah. It's a lessons learned. It's not the background that's invisible of an ongoing tragedy. That's yeah. where I think the narrative is fundamentally different. Yeah. So, Zena, you had a follow-up question? Was it? Oh, Bunir, sorry. Bunir. It's a really interesting point about the aspect of a, rem of a reminder and a, of a lesson that we haven't quite learned yet, I think. But um, uh, and, and the, the vision that came to my mind with this was a giant vertical garden. So actually having yeah. plants, etc., all up along the walls and turning this thing, this behemoth, into something that sprouted growth and beauty. And maybe a library on the inside. I don't know. Maybe this is wishful thinking. And a, and, a, and a music jam space downstairs. I, or, you know, at least, definitely. I, I love it. Vertical garden. Social housing. Uh, Social housing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, well, now that we've reached uh, the next stage of imagination, uh, I want to say a few things. It's a rare occasion when three talented artists are in the same room together. The first, obviously, is Tom Young, who gave us two and a half hours of his time tonight. The second is William Dobson for creating this space. I now can't imagine doing the podcast anywhere else. Yeah, here's for Will. Thank you. And the third, I'm sorry to put pressure on you, is Rawi Hajj sitting in the back. Thank you, Rawi. 
fortunately for us, Ravi will be a guest on the podcast in two weeks. So thank you, Ravi, for willing to join the podcast. That's two Wednesdays from now. Guys, this episode was a real treat. For anyone interested in Tom Young, and this is funny, on Instagram, <laughs> go to Tom Young Art. You'll see his wonderful work uh, for Instagram <laughs> access. But you can see what he's doing all the time. He posts on Instagram regularly. Um, I believe it's Tom Young Art. That's the page on Facebook as well. Yeah. And on Twitter, I found you on Twitter, Tom yeah. Young Art. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're 50, but you're literally as young as I remember when I first saw you some 15 years ago, if not longer. Uh, keep shining because at 50, if you're still in your prime, I look forward to turning 50. <laughs> really. I want to be like you in, when I reach 50 in my element, in this place called home. So... I really appreciate this, Tom. You're a treasure to this country, and I really mean that. Thank wow. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Ronnie Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.